Okay. Live signal is up. You can start your recording, Sergeant. PC is good. Thank you. Owen? Live recording, good. All right. Backup Logo. is good. Thank you. Logo, you may begin. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Small Business. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your video? Once again, would all panelists please turn on your video? To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit any testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you. Good morning. I am Council Member Mark Joe, and I chair the Committee on Small Business, and I would like to welcome you to our hearing on preventing further business losses during a COVID second wave. Small businesses across the city are fighting for their survival. A recent survey by the Hospitality Alliance found that 88% of respondents did not pay their full October rent. And while many small businesses have been unable to pay rent, Thousands of small businesses have closed in New York. According to a city controller report, at least 2,800 small businesses closed permanently between March 1st and July 10th. Partnership in New York City predicts that as many as a third of the 230,000 small businesses in New York City may never reopen. Massive declines in revenue have been a major factor in the closure of small businesses. According to the Opportunity Insights, during the peak of the pandemic in early April, small business revenues were down nearly 70%. This drop in revenue was even more extreme in the leisure and hospitality industry, where, reserve, where revenues were down over 90%. As of October 31st, Total small business revenues were down 45% compared to January 2020, and revenues in leisure and hospitality were down over 75%. While small businesses have therefore begun to slowly recover, I feel like many others that the increase in COVID cases across the city will plunge small business revenues down to where they were during the pandemic's peak. Non-essential businesses in red zones, areas with high COVID infections, have closed temporarily, and restaurants in these areas are limited exclusively to delivery and pickup. Many business owners have expressed their sentiment that they were starting to feel more optimistic a few weeks ago, but are now fearful as restrictions are implemented across the street. I look forward to hear the administration's testimony today on what lessons were learned during the first period of business closures and how the city will work to prevent further steep declines in small business revenue as the city tragically seems to be nearing a COVID second wave. As mentioned, our oversight hearing today serves two main purposes. First, to conduct oversight and assess what went wrong during the city and state's closure of business due to the pandemic? And second, to see what the city will be doing differently to ensure these same mistakes are not repeated. An issue many business owners have faced is the lack of proper notice for mandated closures, which forces businesses and owners of those businesses to throw out already purchased inventory Businesses in New York have also expressed frustration that they have been told to close their restaurants and places of business at the last second, as it causes them to throw thousands of dollars of inventory down the drain, which is money that they do not have. While I understand that the governor has the final say in many of these decisions, I am interested to hear the administration's perspective as well as how the city has publicized and educated small business owners on changing reopening guidelines. 
Small business owners are fearful of further closures. A recent Chamber of Commerce survey found that 85% of small businesses that experience closure fear potential further mandated business restrictions. I look forward to hearing how the city is serving as a strong partner to small businesses to calm these fears. With that said, I'd like to thank my Chief of Staff, Reggie Johnson, Legislative Aide, Austin Sackler, our Senior Legislative Counsel, Christopher Sarari, our Policy Analyst, Noah Meixler, and Financial Analyst, Aliyah Ali, for their hard work in preparing for this hearing. With that being said, I'd like to turn it over to the Committee Counsel, Christopher Saratori. Thank you, Chair Joni. I'm Chris Sartori, Senior Counsel to the Committee on Small Business, and I'll be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you'll be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you'll be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I'll be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called as I will periodically be announcing who the next panelists will be. We will be first hearing testimony from the Department of Small Business Services, followed by members from test followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. For panelists, when called on to testify, please state your name and the organization you represent, if any. Today, we'll be hearing from Janelle Doris, Commissioner of the Department of Small Business Services. At this time, I will administer the affirmation to Commissioner Doris. Commissioner, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. And at this time, I would invite Commissioner Doris to present his testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Jonai and members of the Committee on Small Business. Uh, my name is John L. Doris. As mentioned, I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Small Business Services. It's my pleasure to testify before the City Council today, and it is my sincere hope that each of you and your loved ones are staying safe and healthy during these difficult times. New York City is doing everything we can to fight against the pandemic. I want to thank our elected officials, stakeholders, and our small business community uh, who are doing great work in combating the further spread of COVID-19. We must continue to encourage New Yorkers to wear face coverings, wash their hands frequently, monitor their health, and maintain social distance and comply with state and city policies. To date, SBS has connected more than 4,600 businesses to more than $113 million in financing, impacting 12,000 jobs since the start of the pandemic. This includes more than 47 million via the New York City Employee Retention Grant and the NYC Business Continuity Loan Fund, 22 million via technical assistance uh, provided by our NYC Business Solution Centers, 3 million via the Contract Finance and Loan Fund, and more than a million in our We NYC uh, financing products. As we help our, our businesses recover, we remain focused on and committed to equity. SBS has worked with the Mayor's Office of MWBEs and the Mayor's Office of Contract Services to connect MWBEs to 722 million in pandemic contracting opportunities. The Mayor also signed into law EO 59 that expands the pool of contracts subject to MWBE program and creates more opportunities for MWBEs to win, win procurements. During the summer, a number of small businesses were impacted by looting and vandalism, primarily in the Bronx. We partner with the Mayor's Fund to advance New York City and philanthropic partners uh, to launch the uh, Small Business Emergency Grant Program. The funds aim to assist small businesses with recovery from loss and physical damages caused by looting. Our outreach focused on MWBEs and retail stores with less than 1.5 million in, in annual revenue. We work closely with local community organizations such as bids, chambers of commerce and local merchant associations 
uh, to ensure that we reached businesses that were severely impacted and needed support. The program has awarded 141 grants totaling 1.2 million. In addition, our virtual Workforce One centers have assisted 58,900 job seekers, referred over 30,400 people to jobs, and helped over 900 businesses. Through our reopening resources, we've hosted over 220 webinars, reaching over 47,800 attendees. With a focus on uh, equity of opportunity of, for all, 84% of entrepreneurs attended our webinars in a language other than English. We have also published plain language industry guides available in several languages, which are available on our website. The SBS hotline directly engages and answers small business owners' questions. To date, we have received over 45,700 calls to our reopening guide for reopening guidance, finance and assistance, legal services, compliance support, and more. This pandemic has made us reimagine and reinvent the use of public space. Currently, there are more than 10,700 restaurants participating in our open restaurants program, which allows qualifying restaurants and bars to expand outdoor seating. Following this success, Mayor Bill de Blasio recently announced the Open Storefronts Program, which aims to help small retail businesses rebound during these challenging economic times. This initiative is anticipated to impact 40,000 establishments and 450 employees, 450,000 employees. As we approach the holiday season, this will give customers additional options to shop in person while socially distancing. To ensure that businesses participating in the open restaurants and open storefronts program understand how to comply with key city rules and avoid potential fines, we launched our virtual compliance uh, consultations, providing free virtual one-on-one -on -one consultations that aim to clarify existing regulations and help businesses understand common compliance challenges. These consultations are at no cost to the businesses. SBS outreach teams and I are on the ground every week connecting directly to business owners. This includes our mobile unit, which has provided guidance and resources on site in some of the hardest hit communities. One of our most common challenges we hear when we are in the communities are issues around commercial rent. Our, com our commercial lease assistance program offers free legal services to commercial tenants citywide. Since the onset of COVID-19, we have increased funding for this program and assisted several hundred businesses, primarily from marginalized communities with their lease related matters. We also partnered with City Bar Justice Center via their neighborhood and entrepreneurship law project to connect businesses uh, and business owners uh, to free legal assistance and support with navigating insurance related claims, contracts, and access to federal relief programs. SBS will continue to assist our small businesses and provide the resources they need to operate during the pandemic. But we know that the federal government must contribute in order to meet the full needs of New York City businesses. The HEROES Small Business Lifeline Act, currently awaiting Senate approval, would bring $370 billion in relief providing a broad mix of aid and investment for hard hit and underserved communities. We will continue to advocate for much needed federal assistance for our small businesses. Small businesses will continue to face significant challenges in the coming months. SBS is committed to doing everything we can to support our small business owners and get them the resources they need. I look forward to our continued collaboration with the council on this effort. Thank you for providing me this opportunity to update you on SBS programs and services to assist our small businesses. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, before I turn it back to Chairman Jonah, I'd just like to recognize that we've been joined by Council Members Perkins, Rosenthal, Rodriguez, and Levin. At this time, I will turn it back over to the Chair for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, uh, for participating in today's important hearing. Thank you for traveling the commercial corridors with me uh, during COVID uh, to educate, to make sure that we you know, hand out PPE and to hear the issues and the concerns 
of our small businesses. I truly believe your heart's in the right place. I just don't believe that you have the resources to help our small businesses. For example, I'm also proud of the work that we did with open storefronts and open restaurants. We visited commercial corridors and witnessed firsthand the creativity of our business owners as they redevelop business models to accommodate these challenging times. And some of those projects were very expensive to put together. My question to you, Commissioner, is during a press conference on November 9th, the mayor said that indoor dining should be reevaluated when the city reaches a 2% COVID infection rate. Does SBS currently think indoor dining should close? Is it fair that we allow these businesses to make these investments and are now telling them that they can't use these outdoor dining experiences that they've built? Chairman Joe and I, thank you. Um, as you mentioned, uh, we uh, continue to go and speak to businesses and I really appreciate you from the beginning of this. Uh, when I first became commissioner, uh, my first stop was with you out in the Bronx and uh, you, we've done so many uh, of those corridor visits even in Brooklyn um, recently. And so I, I do appreciate uh, you taking uh, the time to do that with us, but also your commitment to this work. Um, I must say that, you know, look, the, the way that the rules and regulations um, have come down, as you rightfully mentioned, from the state to uh, the city, uh, the mayor did uh, mention uh, that once we see how things are moving forward um, with COVID spikes or not, or uh, compliance with the various regulations as it pertains to outdoor uh, uh, arrangements that uh, most of our um, restaurants have put up. Um, we're committed to making sure that uh, indoor dining, outdoor dining, uh, all of the resources that we provide, including our open storefronts program, is still accessible to our small businesses. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with uh, making sure that everyone is doing what they can and our small businesses are doing that in order to make sure that Folks are, uh, you know, uh, washing their hands, proper hygiene, wearing face masks, doing what they need to do in order to make sure that we keep indoor dining uh, and outdoor dining uh, accessible for our small businesses. Thank you, Commissioner. We know that this has devastated our small businesses. The hardest hit industry, I think we could all agree, is the hospitality uh, industry. But you didn't answer the question. Do you think these eateries should be shut down from outdoor dining? And the problem that we created by giving them hope where they spend thousands and in some of these establishments, tens of thousands of dollars, money that they did not have to build these outdoor experiences and are now facing a potential shutdown. Uh, you know, I would say this, uh, Chair Joe and I, that we don't want any businesses to shut down. I mean, no, no, nobody's, uh, you know, uh, advocating for businesses to shut down. I think that is, um, you know, not what we're saying. I, I'm saying that uh, whatever uh, the health experts are telling us to do, we've got to follow. Uh, a lot of requirements are also coming from the state. But we're committed to helping our small businesses and we want them to stay open. I mean, that is my job to make sure that as many of our small businesses survive this crisis as possible and we will continue to do so. Um, we understand the significant investment small businesses have made, particularly our, in our restaurant industry. This is why we're calling for additional aid from the federal government. I was out yesterday by the, at the Strand with uh, Congresswoman Maloney fighting again uh, for the federal aid to come that's really sitting in on uh, Mitch McConnell's desk and uh, that will provide 370 billion. The restaurants act is in there to provide a different uh, resources. So look, we're advocating, we're pushing on every turn. Uh, we don't want any business to shut down right now. We want to get this crisis under control. Uh, we want to get the rates down so that businesses can continue 
to thrive and come back and uh, get into a place where uh, they can actually uh, conduct business again and uh, build their, their businesses up again. So that's, that's the goal that we have here at SBS. Thank you. Thank you for that, Commissioner. But we're not looking at federal help anytime soon, and it won't come soon enough if these businesses are shut down due to a second wave. Today, there is a small business out there investing in either the open streets or the open restaurants, investing thousands of dollars into this outdoor experience. And in upcoming days and weeks, they could be shut down. What are we doing to inform our small businesses that they should be aware before they spend this money, before they buy their inventory, before they stock their shelves, that this holiday season, you could be shut down. What are you doing as the commissioner of SBS to prevent them from throwing more good money that they don't have against bad money? Thank you for that, and, and I, I'm, I'm glad you brought up uh, what SBS is doing as it pertains to outreach. Um, and from the beginning of the pandemic, throughout all the phases, and even now, so I, I do appreciate that. Look, we've been in contact. You know, we uh, help manage and participate on boards of all 76 bids, which represent over 100,000 small businesses. Uh, we partner with our chambers of commerce. You see that some of our colleagues are going to be speaking here today. Uh, we, we get the word out through them, we get the word out through uh, the bids, we get the word out through our merchants associations. We also have conducted, as mentioned in my testimony, over 200 uh, webinars where this particular items do come up. 47,000 plus businesses have participated. Um, that's how we get the word out. We also uh, send out weekly communication uh, to the small business community of over two hundred thousand recipients uh, to, with everything that is happening in that particular time. So all the guidance materials, uh, if there's particularly uh, some concern about the city uh, reaching a certain uh, threshold, for instance, recently up to 3%, we communicate that out through our networks and through direct contact with small businesses. And lastly, I'm out there, as you know, uh, we are uh, using the press, using our social media, using every tool we have in our toolbox to communicate out to small businesses, uh, the potential risk involved, the challenges, the compliance challenges, all these things with the rules that are coming down either from the state or through our health uh, professionals. And so uh, we will continue to do that. And uh, also I can't, uh, you know, I can't understate the significance of our elected officials like yourself and your colleagues who have been there with us and, um, you know, spreading the word also, uh, making sure that small businesses are aware of the coming regulatory changes and also uh, the various spikes um, in the COVID cases and what it means to small businesses. So um, we have a robust operation when it comes to outreach. Um, and uh, some of it is in person. We have our mobile unit now. Uh, we were in Inwood uh, just this past uh, Friday. Um, we're going to be in Brooklyn uh, uh, this weekend. We're going to, you know, we're all, we're, we're, we're going as many parts of uh, the city as possible. Um, I was out in the Bronx not too long ago again. Uh, we'll be in Staten Island this coming weekend again. Uh, we're spreading the word to make sure that small businesses understand the reality of what a uh, shutdown may be or the challenges that answer the questions to the challenges that they have, uh, you know, as it relates to um, this particular uh, phase of the pandemic. Commissioner, thank you. My question to you is those notices that you're sending out, those 200,000, I guess you said emails, is that what you said? Yes, that's one form of communication, yes. Are any of those emails have a beware, before you make this investment, you should know that COVID cases are on the rise and you may be shut down. Um, I think we communicate to all of the businesses. Oh, the 200,000 emails or so, one of the forms of communicating. Is there a disclosure in there? Be advising and warning our small businesses 
before they make this investment that they can't afford, that there's a potential for a shutdown? I think we, we communicate in essence uh, to the small businesses where we are as it pertains to the shut, potential shutdown. We do, we do say that, we do communicate that. And we do uh, alert businesses to, you know, as they make business decisions to keep all these things in uh, consideration. I'm not sure we use the exact words you used, but we do communicate the essence of what you've just, uh, just uh, uh, mentioned. So Commissioner, I know that it's painful uh, as much for me as it is for you when we see our businesses struggle, anyone struggling, anyone an individual or a business, but not our responsibility, um, the position that you have and that I have is to be a very strong advocate for our small business. The reason for this hearing is to make sure that we learn from the first COVID shutdown and to make sure that we don't repeat some of the same mistakes. We allowed businesses to be just devastated and we're allowing them again to invest in models that uh, with a second phase shutdown will not be, uh, will produce any business whatsoever. An outdoor dining experience or an open storefront experience means they have to be in business. And picking up orders to go is not the investment that will yield, the investment they're making is not going to give them a return on that investment. You and I, have a responsibility to educate these small businesses. Absolutely. And we're not doing it. I know I'm out there, but you're not giving them that disclosure that right now there's a potential within the next few weeks that their businesses could be shut down from an outdoor experience of dining or retail shopping. And we're not warning them. How are you going to do that in, in the different yeah. languages and to make sure that it gets out to everyone? Yeah, Chair Jonah, I, 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 I am an apps, you, you know, we're in agreement on this. I, you know, we have, we have certainly, I don't know if I'm being clear, but we, we, we have said to businesses, uh, when you, uh, when the rules are changed or the, the uh, infection rates are going up, the mayor himself has said this at press conferences, which he holds every day, um, that, uh, there is potential for, for shutdown. Unfortunately, nothing that we want to do. When we send out those communications, they do outline very specifically what those uh, uh, requirements could be. We do say what is already known. Um, and we have to wait on the correct information also to say to businesses because we don't want to give them incorrect information. So as information comes in from the state, from the health department, we communicate that and sometimes it's not just once a week, it's several times, depending on the, uh, the incoming information. So I do agree with you uh, that we will continue to do that. We think it's, vi it's, it's vital. Folks need to know exactly what the rules are, but as we get them, we give them out. And so uh, we, we can't, I can't give out what I do not know at the time, or I can't speculate because then it's even more dangerous for businesses. So, but what we do say, is as those rules come out, as requirements come out, we do translate that and get that over to businesses. So we do agree with you on that. Thank you. Can I ask for a copy of that uh, email blast that you do? Can you send that over to me now? Someone, some staff is listening. Now. Can you send that to mjoni at council.nyc.gov? While my other colleagues start asking questions, I would like to see that, and I'm going to read it, the last notice I received, and I don't want to prejudge, there was no notification in there about a potential shutdown. But I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. If you would be so great, I would be grateful if anyone were to send me that notice so I can read it while some of my colleagues ask questions. And then we will see how clear it is that we're educating and warning our businesses in advance. Can you do that for me? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, am I on? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, sure. I mean, we can have someone send over our latest uh, outreach. That, that would be great. 
So my last question before I pass it over to my colleagues, we often wait for the federal, we keep applying on the federal aid. That aid may come, may not come, it may come sometime next year, we're not sure. Uh, we obviously know during the $49 million grant and loan program that the city initiated at the beginning of this COVID was not nearly enough. And we know that there was real issues in how those grants and loans were distributed throughout the five boroughs. The borough of the Bronx received only 1% of the total loans that were allocated. Are we on the, have we learned from our mistakes and what is the city prepared to do without federal aid to make sure that the help is equally distributed throughout the five boroughs? And what dollar amount do you think that will look like without federal aid? Uh, thank you. And certainly for the uh, loan and grant program, you know, 3% is not. Uh, uh, certainly what we wanted for the Bronx, as you know, uh, when we talked about, about that. Uh, but certainly um, we've done uh, things uh, a lot differently. We've uh, changed uh, the way that we go about uh, setting our metrics and also uh, outreach, which by the way is the most important piece is businesses need to know about it in order to um, facilitate them, their, them applying. And so we have, we have done that. Um, a perfect example is the emergency uh, grant that was given out for looting over 60% was in the Bronx. Uh, we made sure of that and we did that in a way that uh, with our community partners in the Bronx, uh, several of uh, the community um, based organizations and also bids, et cetera, work with us so we can specifically get to businesses uh, in those areas. Um, similarly to uh, how we're working with uh, other outside groups like LISC and others, uh, who have specific programs for uh, small businesses. We also are looking at LMI communities, low to moderate income communities as targets since they are disproportionately more affected by this uh, particular pandemic than any other group. And so looking into those areas, uh, looking through our grant programs to um, our bids and also some other uh, organizations that we work with. So look, we've been deliberate about that. Um, I think even uh, my attention to the outer boroughs in our five borough strategy, uh, the physical presence we have there, uh, reinforcing assistance to our um, business solution centers, and also uh, our workforce one centers. And so I'm uh, making sure that those who are seeking jobs are able to get assistance. Uh, and so we, you know, we do hear you on that, and we've changed uh, some of our methodology and how we approach it, how we partner with. Uh, community organizations to help and assist us to meet those goals. Um, I don't have a number uh, for you as it pertains to what the city uh, can do, um, seeing the city's uh, financial situation at the moment. Um, right now, I, I only can say that we are uh, constantly looking for ways that we can continue to invest in our uh, businesses, but also open other opportunities for them. Uh, to, to increase revenue uh, and, and to give an opportunity for them to survive. Uh, you know, one of those is around our uh, anchor strategy we announced uh, in late in the, in, the, in the summer, early fall. How do we utilize the anchors um, who are constantly purchasing things, um, the hospitals, the, the, uh, the uh, arts institutions, uh, financial institutions, uh, those who are here anchored in the city and in communities, how do we get our small businesses plugged in to their uh, supply chains? We're doing that. We're actively doing that. The mayor announced that. And so we've, we've, we, you know, we've done things of that nature and we will continue to do so to make sure uh, businesses do have opportunities. Um, Commissioner, I, I appreciate that maybe some of these questions, but at this point, I would imagine we should have a think tank that is looking at all of the options that we're going to have on a what or what a second loan and grant program way uh, with a second COVID way would look like. If we don't have a think tank coming up with the possibilities with or without federal aid, then we're just gonna be reactive and our businesses are going to be allowed to fail 
we're not going to be there for them in their time of need. If we're not thinking about this now and coming up with plans that we can educate our small businesses who are not prepared, we're government, we're supposed to be prepared. Our responsibility is to be prepared for them in their time of need. We've gone through one uh, crisis already. We learn. I hope we learn. But I'm asking you for what looks like is inevitable, a second COVID closure. We don't have a plan in place that we can share with our small businesses. That's government failure. If you can't tell me, Commissioner, that we're going to have eggs dollars ready for loans and grants for small businesses to weather their second closure, why does SBS exist? This is potentially in the upcoming weeks. They won't have time to wait for us to figure it out. We're supposed to be doing this in advance, learning from the first shutdown. And here's what we're prepared to do. Mission. Am I being too difficult? Am I being too direct? This is the this is the feedback that I'm getting from my small businesses. Mark, in the event of a second closure, what are you prepared to do? We're going to need loans and grants to get us through this. Are you thinking about the dollar amounts? And if we don't have that answer for them in advance of a second closure, we have failed. Well, yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Jonah. Look, I, I look, I agree with you. Nobody wants a second shutdown. Now, we have a small business council, as you know, um, that meets regularly, um, that we put forth uh, recommendations uh, that they have heard. Uh, we've heard from them. We've heard from the small businesses. Uh, our our uh, work is around um, making sure that we increase revenue, reduce cost, and uh, help with the regulatory challenges that these businesses may face if they, if and when we do head into a shutdown. So, I mean, that is, we do have something very comprehensive there. We're also working on, as you mentioned, other financial resources uh, for small businesses. Look, we've helped a significant number of small businesses as SBS, $113 million already. We will continue to do that. We have built the infrastructure from the first wave that we've experienced that we know exactly what we need to do in when and if something else happens. So we have the infrastructure, we have the communication infrastructure, we have the support services for financial assistance, we have the legal support services that we give to businesses. We've got also, as I mentioned, opportunities for them to grow their business outside of their traditional models. That's including anchor strategies and also uh, helping them to get online with our, our tech advisors and our partners like MasterCard, which we have. And so we, you know, we've got a significant number of resources ready for our small businesses and uh, we're ready to deploy them. We've got partners right now. We're working with LISC on grant programs uh, that's out there right now as we speak. Um, and you know, look, we're continue to add additional partners uh, to that. So we do have a plan. We have an infrastructure. We have a small business committee that we meet with regularly. Some of your speakers today are on that committee. And certainly we will continue to expand and do everything we can. We are in total agreement with you about the concern around uh, a second wave, but we are ready and we are prepared. And ready we will continue to do what we're doing. To help small they have a lot of questions, but ready means we also know the dollar amount. With or without federal aid, we're supposed to know the dollar amount that'll be available to them so that they are informed in advance of a second shutdown, not left in limbo to figure this out and navigate uncharted waters again when they're waiting for guidance. I am talking about specific loans and grants. And we don't have a dollar amount in mind. No one's or you're not sharing with me, and that means everyone else, what funding will be available, if any. And if it's nothing, there's, there's no more, uh, there's no uh, money available, then we should let them know, guys, if there's a shutdown, and if we 
we will not have any loans or grants for you. So they can figure out what options they do have available. But keeping them um, in limbo hurts. It doesn't help. Uh, I, I know, Commissioner, that other colleagues want to ask you questions, and I want to pass it back to uh, the council so the council members can ask their questions. Thank you, Chair. At this time, we'll just move on to council member questions for the time being. I will um, now call on other members to ask their questions in the order that they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Uh, council members, if you'd like to ask a question but have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now and I will call on you in order. At this time, we will first hear questions from, we had council member 11 who had raised his hand before. Council Member Levin, do you still have a question? Yes, Council Member Levin does have a question. Please go ahead, Council Member Council Member Levin, please go ahead. Thank you very much. I, I apologize, I have a crying baby here in the background, but um, I did wanna ask about, um, and I thank you, Commissioner, for being here and thank you, Chair. Um, I, um, I was speaking with a, a friend of mine um, the other day who has a small business um, and I was talking to him about PPP and he said that the, the first round of PPP really saved his, um, allowed him to stay in business, um, has kept him alive uh, to this point. Um, he's looking at um, the first quarter of next year, um, uh, and this is in a kind of manu they manufacture uh, 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 stage production material and things like that. Um, uh, the first quarter of next year, if he doesn't receive a second round of PPP, he doesn't know how he's going to make it. Um, my I guess my first question is, what is the de Blasio administration doing reaching out to the incoming um, Biden administration, um, uh, the transition team, uh, members of Congress to ensure that New York City based small businesses um, uh, will be able to receive some relief um, on the next round, hopefully within the next month or two. So that'd be my first question. Thank you, Council Member. Sir, I was trying to unmute there. Um, so we're in total agreement there. Um, as you know, the PPP program, the challenge we had uh, from the inception it was, were several. Um, one was the utilization of large banks uh, and not community development financial institutions or CDFIs who actually are underground or community lending institutions who help these small businesses and work with them uh, and so that was changed. We lobbied very hard for that. And then also there was an additional $60 billion put into a fund to help in, uh, those uh, and set aside almost for CDFIs, which then we saw that through that process, smaller businesses like New York City businesses were getting more funding. So uh, your, your colleague you're mentioning, um, I think is very, very important what they're saying as it pertains to PPP. We've, uh, SBS, have, uh, you know, worked with uh, the SBA uh, uh, association here in the city uh, to really connect, um, I think, over $35 million in funds uh, to small businesses through the PPP program, and we'll continue to do that. But you're right, unless there is some additional, uh, some additional utilization of the remaining $130 billion in the PPP program, um, small business will go without that. And so we have been lobbying already and before even uh, the election, we've been pushing out of federal government, but also uh, through our federal affairs office, through my office, through uh, direct contacts with SBA, we've been pushing not only the full utilization of the $130 billion that's left in the PPP program, but also uh, some creative ways around rent uh, reduction, helping commercial, uh, commercial, um, uh, commercial uh, partners who, uh, yeah, no, you know, who are struggling themselves because folks are not being able to pay them. 
figure out some ways through the regulatory process to get uh, some changes so that they can pass that on to small businesses. We've been pushing that idea. Uh, we've been pushing several uh, other ideas around uh, utilization of the Muni, uh, the, the Muni facility, that's the municipal facility at the federal, uh, the, the feds um, and treasury that allows municipalities to borrow dollars uh, to help small businesses. The challenge here is uh, the, the, the number of, of dollar, the number of, uh, sorry, percent on it's 4% or so or something uh, outrageous. Uh, so it makes it um, you know, improbable for uh, municipalities to get that money and use it, utilize it. So I agree with you 100%. We've been talking to them for a lot of our ideas around rent, around the Restaurant Act, getting all those things through and why it's important uh, for, for New York City. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and another question um, is around language access. Uh, what is SBS doing for um, small businesses that are in uh, immigrant communities that um, that might not be uh, uh, English proficient, how how is um, how is SBS addressing that issue of language access? Thank you for that question. As you know, um, you know, I, I always say this. Not that it matters in a sense, but it matters to me. Uh, you know, as an immigrant myself, understanding and making sure, uh, and as a former small business owner myself, this is at paramount and of course, leading the city's MWBE program when I did. Uh, this is critical for me. And um, I've made it a, a priority here at SBS that out of the 47,000 participants in our 220 webinars that we've had, over 80% or so, 85% was done in another language, okay? And so for us, that's so critical that we, we do that. Um, also, all of our materials are either translatable on our website or we translate them ourselves uh, when the flyers, if you go around certain communities, uh, immigrant communities, you see our flyers in different languages um, and we do that on purpose. And then lastly, really partnering with community organizations who uh, work within those communities, immigrant communities, uh, to make sure that our, the word is getting to those businesses and of course, us being in those immigrant communities or communities which English is not primarily the first uh, language, for instance, we're in Inwood. Uh, last Friday, we were in Richmond Hill, uh, again, uh, Bengali uh, and, and other types of languages being spoken there, uh, uh, Spanish, et cetera. We were there with our mobile outreach um, with different uh, flyers in different languages. Uh, when you call into our hotline, uh, there's 200 languages being spoken there. You can, uh, as an immigrant, uh, sec English as a second language, you can actually access help and resources from our hotline in the language that you desire. So I appreciate that, Councilman Levin. I'm in agreement 100% with you, but we're doing all we can in that area. Uh, certainly looking forward to doing more additional outreach um, as new requirements come to bear. We will certainly be doing that. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Levin. Uh, there are no other council members with questions at this time, so I'll turn it back to Chair Joan I for any additional questions. Thank you. So, um, Commissioner, um, I received the email, and there is no indication on here of an increase in COVID cases or a beware. The closest thing that comes to any type of warning is, as you are all well aware, this pandemic is not yet over. That's all it says. There is no re re reference to the number of cases, the uptick, the zones, there is no disclosure, nothing that forewarns small businesses before they make these significant investments that there's a potential shutdown. You muted? Okay. Yeah, no, thank you. I Look, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm just checking with the team to see which one you receive. Again, we send uh, quite a few of these out uh, on a weekly basis. So I wanna make sure you get the right one. Normally what happens 
the closer we are to a particular announcement, say the, as the mayor had announced uh, um, about the 3% and the closure of schools, et cetera, when we put, when we put the, uh, the uh, announcement out at that time, generally speaking, we do make uh, folks aware of that. So I'm not sure, and I'm sorry, I'm checking with the team to make sure um, you may need a few of them to be sent to you in order for you to get a better sense. Uh, that might be specific. Uh, that was one sent on Friday the 20th. So we have to go team. If you're listening to me, please go back a little further. That's more connected to when uh, the guidance um, was coming out and we'll get that to you. Uh, when I'm looking at uh, commissioner, by the way, is November 20th where the mayor is wishing everyone a happy holiday and uh, to encouraging on how to have a safe holiday. So that's the last one. But yeah. while your team looks that up, we'll continue. So November 28th, there's a report from the administration that is due on details of how the distribution of the first round of loans and grants uh, were uh, dispersed. Are we going to have that report on time? We intend to fulfill our compliance requirements. Great. Commissioner, as you know, retailers rely on this time of the year for a bulk of their sales. As we speak, small mom and pop businesses are buying inventory on the hopes that this holiday season, they'll be able to sell their products to get them out of the hole that they're in. And this is the concern. Many of them have had depleted their credit lines. They are now, being, now, they are now purchasing cash at hand. For many of them, they're using personal funds and putting themselves further into debt to get through this holiday season in hope of rebounding. Are we prepared for the devastation if we lose this holiday season hopes where there will, retail will be shut down Traditional brick and mortar will not be able to sell their products. Are we preparing them? Yeah, I, I, I do agree with you, the concern there, and we believe that we are ready. Uh, you know, uh, Chairman uh, Joe and I, as we mentioned, the infrastructure, one, to communicate, and two, to assist small businesses, um, we built it over the last several months. We are communicating with them. We know how to reach them. We have their information. We know who they are and we can get to them with the critical information if need be. Uh, God forbid there is a shutdown. The open storefronts program. Also, we heard from our bids, we heard from our chambers, we heard from small businesses themselves. We need a way, 70% of my sales we heard come at this time. We need a way to do it where we can expand more. We're only at 50% capacity indoors. We want to do this safely. We want folks to be able to social distance. We also want to be creative. If we put stuff out in front, people see it. They can actually come and buy it right there, right in front of the store. So look, I feel like that is critical because we've heard from the community. We responded. We are ready and prepared if they need financial assistance, uh, we are prepared in our business solution centers, our hotline, 45,000 calls, 70% of them are about how can you help me with financial support? We've done that, $113 million. Look, we have the infrastructure. And so I hear you, the concern, I agree with the concern because it's one of mine, you know, we are passionate about small businesses uh, and we don't want to see any business shut down or industry shut down again. Uh, but we wanted to say to folks, we're going to do everything we can to keep uh, the rates down, social distance, wear your mask, do everything we can as a community. And we have to reinforce that to the community to make sure that everybody is doing that. And so uh, we are health focused and we want to make sure of that uh, because the health crisis brought on the economic crisis. We have the infrastructure to help and support small businesses. We currently have it and we will continue to use that. Uh, God forbid there is another shutdown. Thank you, Commissioner. If there's another or a second shutdown, is this administration prepared to suspend real estate taxes, water and sewer payments, 
or sales tax payment. Is that in the arsenal that you're aware of? I'm not aware of that, sir. And as, as you can imagine, um, I'm sure uh, other uh, ideas around uh, what we can do. I know there's ideas at the state level about additional support and other uh, tax relief and various uh, matters. And so, look, we are we want to make sure that our small businesses are here. So I, I, I hear you on those fees and fines and regulatory requirements. Um, we've went on an educational tour, making sure that businesses know what the rules are, what the regulations are. As it pertains to those, I, I can't comment on those now. I don't have an answer on those particular items. Certainly we'll take them back and, uh, and, and get back to you. Commissioner, we brought this up on the first hearing on the first shutdown. Uh, we sent uh, a, a sign-on letter uh, demanding that the administration suspend these payments to allow these businesses um, to use that cash to help rebuild their businesses, to change their business models. It fell on deaf ears. And what you're telling me now, and I'm going to paint an ugly scenario for you. It looks like there's a second wave shutdown coming. We're allowing businesses to spend money that they don't have on open streets and open restaurants that they can't use. We're allowing businesses to buy inventory for the holiday season that there's a good possibility they will not be open for the holiday season. And we're gonna tell them, although you have no revenue coming in and you can't pay your rent or your employees, don't forget to pay your real estate taxes, water and sewer and sales tax, because if you don't, we're gonna charge you interest compounded to make sure that we put you out of business. And we have no loans and grants program allocated in case there's a second shutdown for you to tap into. We have no dollar amounts. We have nothing that we can offer you today. Some of the reports that I've heard can lead to a closure similar to Brooklyn and Queens in the next two weeks. Am I wrong here on my assessment, Commissioner? What I just projected? Yeah, I, I would just say, uh, Mr. Chair, that look, I, you know, I think I think we we agree on on this concept around being able to support a business who calls in or says, "I need help." And SBS has done that over one hundred and eight service thousand services provided to these businesses. When folks call, when folks say they need help we help them. And so I do disagree with the, the notion that somehow we don't have resources available or not in place, or there's no plan. That's, that just doesn't add up. I mean, in my testimony, I outlined all that is being done and is there for small businesses. Case in point. Um, as with the legislate, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm sorry, go ahead. I thought you were... No, I was just saying with the legislate, uh, the, I know there was legislation passed Oh, and you talked about interest um, as well, DOF. Uh, there was some legislation passed there to reduce uh, late payment interest um, as well. And uh, we'll continue to, to reduce it, yes. Um, reduce, not, uh, not remove, reduce. Still have to pay. And if you don't pay, you're gonna be paying interest. Correct, and that city council passed, leg yeah, city council passed legislation um, that that reduce the five, reduce late payments, interest, and 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 so forth. Um, but look, I, you know, I think the main point I want I want to just reiterate is, if a business needs support, a business can call us uh, eight 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 SBS four NYC. You call us, forty five thousand businesses have already, and they've gotten support, and seventy percent of those businesses called about financial assistance, and they've gotten support. We've already given out, uh, given out and or helped connect or orchestrated 113 million for those businesses. So I, you know, I, I, I just want again, just reiterate, I hear your concern, but I also want to let businesses know that that's our role at SBS. If you need help, you call us, you will get the help. That's what we're committed to doing. Um, and so I don't want, I don't want a business to 
to look at this here and say, oh, the city has left you out to dry. That is not the case. And uh, again, we've already, you know, 100, over 108,000 services provided to small businesses in this pandemic. And so, look, we'll continue to do so. And, uh, you know, we know there's more to be done. This is why we say we need federal help, just like with unemployment, we needed federal help, just like with any other part of this tragedy, we need federal help. It's the same thing here on the small business side. We've got the HEROES Act. It needs to be passed. There's restaurant uh, provision in there. Um, Congresswoman woman, uh, Maloney yesterday talked about the PREA Act, which has helped also uh, with business interruption insurance, which by the way is in large part why we were, are the way where we are now because insurance companies refused to honor business interruption insurance for businesses. And, and again, that they've been paying into for such time. And now they did not honor that. Again, a large part why we are where we are now, she's introduced legislation to actually fix that problem. These are types of solutions that we need from a federal level. We also talked about helping commercial rent with commercial mortgages and passing that on to the, uh, the tenant and the business. And we also know that that also requires the federal government to make changes in the regulatory environment in order to make it applicable to small businesses. And so these are all things we're pushing for. Um, and we know that they have real results, but until those come, SBS is here uh, to help small businesses. And we will continue to do that. Thank you, Commissioner. But to ask you then, for the neighborhoods of Brooklyn and Queens, where restrictions were recently imposed, which forced the closure of non-essential business in October, did SBS collect data on how the revenue for such businesses were impacted during those times? And what did you do to help them? They were shut down. So yeah, sure. I was in the red zones. I was in the yellow zones. I was uh, in the orange zones, personally out there working with those businesses, connecting them to resources. Again, that's what we do. And so um, when it happened, I was, I was the next day I was in the Rockaways. Uh, I was in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, uh, in communities where that was part of it. And I will continue to do that. And that's, and I was physically there uh, with my team uh, to, to help those businesses. And we did. And so, uh, you know, part of, uh, again, what we do as small business services, uh, when these things happen, we make sure that our resources are available, sir, uh, to those businesses. And, we, and, and we've done that. And, and there's nothing is going to change. Uh, God forbid something else happens. We are there on the ground with those businesses, working with them, getting them the resources that they need. So the question is, what are those resources that you provided them? They were shut down. Yeah, sure. So businesses ask for, uh, you know, financial assistance. So we have our business solution centers. We connect them. We work with them to get those resources to them. Businesses wanted to know additional information. As you know, information is key in the small business world. We gave those inf the information to them, all the, all the requirements. We have our virtual uh, consultants who literally with a camera, uh, from obviously from, from our offices and the business on, on the ground, walk them through the process so that they know what the requirements are, what they can't, can't do. So, uh, and, and that's what businesses are asking for. We're giving businesses what they're asking for. They're asking for guidance. We gave them guidance, asking for, for financial support. We did so, uh, and we will continue to do so. On, on the financial resources, what did you do specifically? Are you able to tell me how you found the money Sure. I mean, we, uh, I, the process is the business calls us or we connect with them on the ground. Uh, we have our business solution centers. The business will give a profile. Here's my concern. Here's what I need funds for. We then will run that, fill in all the applications for them, work with them. And then there's CDFIs, banks, 40 lenders that we have. And then we then facilitate the transactions between those and the business. So we are, it's a white glove service that we offer those businesses. Uh, and those are the types of services that we provide on the financial side. So it's strictly loans. Do you know what the interest rate of those loans were? Uh, some of them are 0%. Some of them maybe, uh, you know, two, three, 4%. It depends uh, on the entity and it depends on the business. As you know, the bit, bit, every business is different. 
Uh, some businesses can uh, depend on the uh, CDFI and what they're offering, um, what they can actually offer to a particular business. Can we get a um, outline from you on the dollar amounts in the form of allocations that were done for finance for those two districts, Brooklyn and Queens, during the last um, shutdown? And the loss of revenue for those businesses, if, you can, if you're getting that information. Because that's how we assess what we need to do. Your loss of revenue, what were your needs, what was the dollar amount of the aid that you received from us? Yeah, we're happy to give as much information as we, we have and, 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 and get, it, get as much information on our loan and grant programs, our financial assistance programs, and what that $113 million look like. I, I don't think that's a, that's a challenge for us. We'll get that info to you. Commissioner, I know that you're going to be leaving soon, but I haven't received that second email yet. Okay, we'll, we'll uh, wait for the, waiting on the team to get it. Sorry. I mean, we can, we can send over, uh, look, I, I understand what, I understand the point and we can send um, a series of them maybe for the, for the month, they'll be probably helpful. Uh, so you can probably get a better sense. Um, so I, I hope the team is, maybe they're compiling it to get it to you. Would, Commissioner, I would be willing and happy to work on this with you, but you talk about Two things that businesses needed, financial resources and then information. If we're not giving them the information ahead of time, then it's a disservice. And financial resources are connected to banks and loans that they may get, may not get, at what percentage, I'm not sure. I'm looking forward to hearing that report. Uh, we're not doing enough work. Uh, these businesses have been paying income tax to the city of New York. They've been paying real estate taxes, water and sewer charges. They've been paying into the system. And at their time of need, we're not giving them what they deserve. Okay? Our small businesses have helped build this city. They are a major contribution to the tax, uh, uh, to our tax base. They are our backbone. They are the job creators. They are what make our neighborhoods and communities such a great place to live and invest in. They speak multiple languages. And in their time of need, it doesn't look like we're going to be there for them on a second shutdown from the first. If we don't have a dollar amount, and I believe the first loan and grant program was $49 million for 230,000 businesses in the city of New York, that entitles each one of those in businesses to a cup of coffee, is what it really equates to. Not much more than that, let alone help rebuild their businesses. And connecting them to resources, um, to go to a banking the default answer of federal dollars, federal aid, when they've been paying into the city tax base all along. It took us through some bad times and have really delivered for us in the good times. And I still don't see a plan for them. Something tangible. Something that eases their concerns, that lets them sleep at night to say, my city, the city that I've helped build my taxes to has assured me that if there's a second shutdown, here are the dollar amounts that we're going to have available to you, small businesses, so that you can survive. And don't worry about paying your real estate taxes, which I, I believe are due December 31st. I believe sales taxes are due in January, and water and sewer rates, I believe, are due in January also. They'll be forced to pay interest for failing not to meet the payment needs to those three categories. We're not doing enough permission. We're really not there for them. And when they go, and with the projection of 30% of our small businesses not reopening, will be a devastation to our economy. These are not my numbers. 
These are the reports. 30% of small business may not reopen. That was based on COVID's first closure and the change in consumer behavior and e-commerce. We've spoken about this several times. What are we doing to educate New Yorkers on the importance of shopping locally? Where we explain 67 cents out of every dollar that you spend locally stays locally. If you're going to shop and you have to do it uh, e-commerce, do it locally so the money stays locally. Maybe you can help me with before the end of the season, before the closures happen, the importance of educating New Yorkers on why to shop locally. We've been at this and we've spoken to EDC and this administration. What are we prepared to do to educate New Yorkers now ahead of this holiday season to buy local, shop local? Commissioner, you're muted. Yeah, thank you. Um, I can control the mute button here, folks. So please just let me do that. Um, I, you know, I feel that I, you know, I certainly hear you and really, really appreciate the concern there. You know, we have the all in campaign uh, that's been going on uh, selling, you know, from uh, NYC and company. Uh, we've been working with them. Uh, they've got programs uh, with MasterCard and others uh, where there's incentives there for small businesses to participate. Uh, for folks to sign up, for us to drive it home. Uh, there's advertisements everywhere about being all in uh, to uh, with, uh, with uh, shopping local, shopping small. Uh, our advisory committee, we talked to them about this. Uh, they're out there doing it. We're trumpeting it. Um, there's certainly more to come on that. Um, we're very excited about what's about to happen, where we're going with that. Uh, so as I mentioned on our last quarter walk, I mean, there's, there is uh, some, some things we're going to be uh, sharing uh, in the near future on that. Um, and so, look, I, I agree with you. We want everybody to shop local. Um, I've done numerous interviews in the last week and weeks and been saying the same thing. Every time folks see me speaking, I'm encouraging them to, to shop local, particularly now in the holiday season when 70% of businesses actually get their revenue, our retail businesses. So uh, we're, we're in 100% we're in agreement. Uh, we just got to get, continue to get the word out, continue to say it over and over and over again. And uh, certainly our council members can be helpful there, community leaders, everybody uh, telling folks that we've got to shop local, we got to shop small. Commissioner, thank you. You referenced earlier the Small Business, the small business Advisory Council. It's been reported that the advisory council hasn't convened in months. According to the Bronx Chamber of Commerce president, Lisa Soren, after phase two happened, the meetings stopped. According to the Asian American Federation president, when we were asked to serve on these committees, I said yes with the expectations and the hopes that the things that were, we would be talking about would be implemented. I think it would be an understatement to say I'm disappointed. I'm actually very frustrated and very, very angry. How do you respond to these small business advocates? And do you know if they had a recent meeting? Yeah, of course. I, I'm a part of that meeting and I conduct those meetings. Uh, we've had, I think, nine meetings or so. We just recently had two meetings in the last month. So I'm not sure what, what that's uh, this saying. This was the last year. But I'm not... The last meeting, um, we can oh, get- The last that. hearing, I'm sorry. At my last hearing, this was brought up. I'm not, uh, oh. I believe you were not there. The deputy commissioner was there. Oh, I'm sorry. No, well, we've, listen, this is, we've we've recently had one. And, and again, some of you, the folks who are gonna be speaking here on, on that committee, uh, and uh, we've met several times within, I think at least two times the last month. And then before that as well, we've already had about nine meetings. Um, you know, all the work that we're doing here is based on, in part, what we get feedback from those, the committee members. Uh, we were just out with uh, the Asian American Federation in Maury Hill last week um, and uh, working with those businesses there. So I'm not sure, uh, with, I'm not sure about this information, but certainly 
uh, the the committee has been meeting. We continue to meet, um, and I think we're we're having uh, great opportunities to speak with uh, with businesses and come up with creative solutions. Uh, we've also uh, did some hard push advocacy from the committee on the federal level as well. I, I, I'm 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 sorry. I'm, I just uh, I'm not sure I agree with, with the sentiments there. I mean, we've we've met and we continue to meet. Uh, many times with th those committees and hear and hear from them and implement the the suggestions that they have put forth. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, are you and the administration, particularly the mayor, you're, you are the mayor's eyes and ears on small business sector. How often and when was the last time you met with the mayor uh, about the shutdown um, and the potential for a second shutdown? Yeah, certainly. Uh, so, you know, we have a, what was that last, uh, last week, you know, you know, I heard, I, we hear these, uh, you know, certainly the comments about, about if we meet with the mayor or not, you know, some commission of small business services, I'm in constant communication with the mayor about small business work. And um, I'll just, uh, I'll leave it at that. That's, that's my job. And that's what I do. I know that you have you have to leave in a few minutes, and I know that we have. Um, I believe it is um, the borough president uh, Gail Brewer is with us, and I think she may have a question for you, and I want to make sure she addresses you uh, before she before you have to go, if that's okay. Commissioner, please send me that email over. I haven't received anything as of yet. Uh, maybe a staff will put that over as soon as possible. Steve, are you able to get? Um, the borough president on? Uh, Chair Jonah, it doesn't appear that the borough president is on at this time. So uh, I think uh, we can move on unless she does appear within the next few minutes. Commissioner, I'm sure that your staff will be following this hearing as we get a testimony of uh, stakeholders and perhaps we can learn more from them and help uh, address their issues. You're muted. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'm being muted. Uh, yeah, sure. Absolutely, sir. Our team will be on and we'll continue to be on to hear from the advocates and the other electeds and be responsive to you. Will you be advocating um, alongside of the small businesses and their stakeholders and the chambers that are and the bids that are going to be calling on this administration to suspend real estate tax payments, water and sewer payments? sales tax payments to the city, especially in lieu of a, a second closure that we're all facing? We're certainly going to advocate on things to help small businesses. Um, I can't specifically outline all those uh, requirements you just mentioned, but we will continue to do our advocacy for our small businesses. And um, that's what we do and we continue to do so. We often, we speak frequently and these times, uh, we, we must, and I'll continue to do that. Can I expect from you a meeting or a further conversation on the dollar amounts the city of New York is prepared uh, to put into a loan and grants program uh, in the event of a second closure? I'm happy to discuss, uh, you know, what our thoughts are. Absolutely, we'll continue to do that, sir. I think we have a great working relationship here, and. Uh, I appreciate your input and guidance and uh, your, your advocacy and, and, and compassion for these small businesses as we do. And so absolutely, I, I look forward to that. Commissioner, I know you're just as passionate and concerned and that's why I, this is not an attack on you. I just don't think you have the resources that you need to help our small businesses. They're not being provided to you. With the fourth rate of federal, 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 that may come, it may come too late, the devastation in the meantime, is irreparable. These businesses are in trouble. And uh, waiting for federal aid um, in anticipation of that aid is not easing their pains. It's not keeping their doors open. They're actually being nailed shut. And and the city of New York is pushing those nails into those doors by making sure that they continue to pay fees that they can afford by allowing them to make investments into outdoor dining and outdoor uh, retail that they will be forced to shut down in the upcoming weeks. I hope that's not the case, because that means the COVID 
of cases will not be on the rise, but all of the evidential, all of the indicators are there. A second closure seems imminent. And it's up to New Yorkers to practice safe and social distancing, wear a mask to prevent that from happening. Uh, but I don't think we're going to be there uh, in their most time of need uh, in the event of a second closure. So thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Council, I'll have to hand it back to you on the um, those that are ready to testify. Thank you, Chair. At this point, we will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given five minutes to speak. Please begin once uh, the Sergeant at Arms has given you the cue to begin. Council members, again, who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom hand raise function, and I will call on you after the pan panelist has completed their testimony. Down, but I'm for panelists, once you have been called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin. So again, please wait for the Sergeant to give you the cue to start. At this point, we will be hearing from Thomas Gretsch of the Queens Chamber of Commerce, followed by Andrew Riggi. Time starts now. Sir, please hold on to be unmuted. All set, can you folks hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, all. Thank you, Chair Do uh, Jonai and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Tom Gretsch. I'm the President and CEO of the Queen's Chamber of Commerce. It is my pleasure to be here today on behalf of our 1,300 member businesses, the vast majority of which are small businesses. In fact, 90% of our members, 90% have 10 or fewer employees. As the oldest and largest business association, we have seen firsthand the devastation the pandemic has caused and the challenges it has presented throughout the city. Many cherished neighborhood institutions could not withstand the revenue losses due to the shutdown and have closed their doors for good. One of the industries that has been particularly hard hit is the restaurants and hospitality industry. In 2019, our city was home to 23,000 restaurants that provided over 317,000 jobs and delivered nearly 27 billion in taxable sales in 2019. But in June, employment in this industry fell to 91,000, according to a report by Comptroller, New York State Comptroller Tom DiNapoli. In June, four of every five restaurants and bars were unable to pay their full rent, according to a study done by my friend and a fellow presenter today, New York Hospitality Alliance, Andrew Riggi. Today, sadly, my estimate is that nearly 50% or one half of the 6,000 restaurants that are just in Queens may never ever reopen. The businesses that have survived are doing so by the skin of their teeth. A second COVID wave, which it appears we're in right now, even if it's only a fraction as bad as it was earlier this year, will be in the death knell for many restaurants and other small businesses. These establishments give us our, our neighborhood character, provide jobs and economic opportunity. We cannot let that happen. We need a robust federal stimulus package now, one that helps the city and the state maintain essential services like public safety, transportation, and, and, and provides relief to small businesses. We have had numerous uh, press conferences, numerous calls to include the Restaurants Act, the Federal Restaurants Act, that would create a $120 billion stabilization fund for restaurants, saving tens of thousands of jobs. We put together a bipartisan effort before the election with Congressman Peter King from Long Island and our own Queens, Grace Mang, along with support from Greg Meeks, Tom Swazi, and the rest of the Queens delegation to get this done. We need our landlords to work with small businesses to ensure our businesses can stay in our neighborhoods and that Main Street stay vibrant. We need our government leaders to work closely with our businesses to communicate protocols. This includes giving businesses as much warning as possible before designating an area a hotspot and trying to be as precise as possible. Small businesses are struggling in every borough, neighborhood and council district. It is important to note that our small businesses have done everything asked of them 
to keep their employees, customers, and communities safe. They've had a shutdown. When they reopen, they've taken on added costs to operate. We owe it to them to do everything in our power to make sure they can get through this difficult period. These folks are our everyday heroes. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on, on their behalf across Queens and the rest of New York City. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Tom, and I want to thank you for your friendship and the work that you're doing for the small businesses in Queens. Tom, uh, hearing from the SBS today, do you feel more comfortable that in the event of a second closure, that government will be there to help our small businesses during what is going to be the most challenging and difficult hardship? So first off, thanks for that question. It's a really important one. I want to tip my hat to uh, Commissioner um, uh, Janelle Doris. He's been everywhere in our city and especially through our Queens in many occasions. We were able to get the Queens Chamber of Commerce and our headquarters building here at the Boulevard Corporate Center to kind of be our logistics hubs for the County of Queens. To date, we've received over a million disposable face masks that we've distributed all over Queens County, untold gallons of hand sanitizer, face shields, thermometers, you name it. And my hat is off to Janelle Doris and his team for doing that. I will tell you though, that we all know the city and the state do not have the resources. The mayor said it, the governor say it. To me right now, the most important part of this thing is to compel our Washington delegation, both, both the Senate and the Congress to get this aid package passed. We had hopes and, hopes and dreams of having it done before the election on November 4th. It never came to fruition. With this second wave coming, Chair Joe and I, I am very worried that the places that we close over the next six weeks, the most critical part of anybody's business, whether it's Diwali, Christmas, Kwanzaa, you name it, Hanukkah, going into the new year, will devastate our small businesses. This is my fear as well, Tom. The event of a second closure, during this critical time of the year where 70% of their revenue comes in, they lose that ability to sell their products, it will be the final nail. And that will be, when I heard the number that up to 50% of your restaurants in Queens may never reopen, that would be, a, imagine what it means for your retail corridor as well. Uh, less foot traffic, more vacancies. Our commercial corridors will look desolate, which will, have le which will be less inviting to foot traffic. So it's a downward spiral. And that's my concern, that we don't have a plan in place. We haven't been able to say, hey, we learned from the first shutdown. Here's the assessments. Here's the needs. Here's what government prepared to do, whether it be city, state, and federal. But the federal government's not going to be able to act quickly enough for the second closure. And our businesses, again, are going to be left on their own. Not only on their own, but as you heard me mention, they still have to pay their real estate taxes. They still have to pay their water and sewer rates. They still have to pay their sales tax including the other fixed costs, uh, rent excluded. Insurance does not give you a break. If you don't pay within the 30-day grace period, you will lose your policy. But now we're going to have businesses that will not have insurance, which will open them up to more liability, God forbid, and potentially a loss that they can't survive. Because there'll be no coverage for them. Um, I continue to look forward to working with you on addressing these issues. But until the city comes up with its own plan and the state contributes, and ultimately the federal government, I really fear for our small business. I can't see at this point in time a plan that's going to help them navigate this potential second closure. Council member, may I got respond to that comment, please? Certainly. So as you know, um, and like most of my, my fellow chamber leaders in the other four boroughs, I have walked miles and miles and miles over the last few months since the uh, pandemic kind of broke and we were allowed to go outside. I was with you and council member Holden on Fresh Pond Road. I was out with uh, council member Koo in downtown Flushing. I've been out with council member Adams. I've been out with council member Gradenchik in certain areas. And, you know, I've, I've also been, I'm not going to say accused, but I've been taking some lumps for really focusing on restaurants. And I think the reason for that is they drive the economy in so many different ways. Folks go to Astoria for Greek. They go to Roosevelt Avenue for Peruvian and Colombian food. They go to Mama's Empanadas. Those places get our businesses 
up and running and staying running. They walk, they go out in the street. You know, I walk around and see these outdoor dining attempts. Um, I, I also have to make a comment about some of the enforcement tactics. Very, very strict and very, very strenuous. These folks are trying to put everything they have in their life savings into getting the place outdoor dining compliant, which was a, it was and is a great idea. But now that the weather turns, I, I'm very much troubled by some of these tactics that go after some of our small businesses with tremendous fines and very, very difficult rules for them to understand and pursue. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, sir, and the committee. Thank you. It looks like we have been joined by Borough President Gail Brewer. Um, so she had signed on earlier to testify. So if you're ready, Borough President, we can uh, uh, testify now and uh, be followed by Andrew Ridgey. Um, thanks for- uh, Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me? I think you can. Um, I wanna thank the chair, the small business committee. Thank you for this really important issue. And I know that uh, Andrew Ridgey and the chambers are much more experienced than I am, but I do know that, you know, we've lost a lot of jobs. I don't need to tell you, I'm, you're gonna have a copy of my testimony. So I'm not gonna go through all of that, but we know, we know the challenges. So there are a couple of suggestions that uh, we might make. One of them, of course, is to the fact. We walk Broadway from uh, the bottom to the top in 2017, and then we did it again in August of this year. And we found, no surprise to you, a 78% increase in vacancies. And that's where we're gonna be challenged, not only now, but into the future. And I know the city council has passed legislation that by February of 2021, we will know that data. Because I have to say, uh, we thought it was a good idea before, but it's even a good idea in the future, even more so. Um, and I have to say that we have to figure out how we're gonna deal with these vacancies, how we can be helpful to the chambers, to the owners, to the small businesses, because when you have a vacancy, you have trouble, usually homeless or garbage next door. And it really hurts those that are in business, number one. Number two is Manhattan has this commercial rent tax. I think we've been talking about that forever from Murray to 96th Street across the entire borough. And we either have, it has been reduced, I know, but we, I think it should be eliminated, particularly given the COVID situation, that's number two. And then the other issue is we learned a lot from the paycheck protection program that when it became available. And I think one of the challenges is for the future is how we can make sure our community development financial institutions, the CDFIs and local banks are more, so get more support in the future because the big banks did not help. We hope that in Washington, we will get more dollars. And I just wanna say we have to uh, strengthen the CDFIs in the future. Um, I know that uh, the state of Pennsylvania has done a lot along those lines. They have a formalized network of the CDFIs. They have trusted local lenders as a result. And they have made sure that they're e easy to find. So small business should create and maintain a list and a map of all the CDFIs and the trusted local banks in each borough so that it's online and obviously part of our open data portal so that people know where they can go. That made a big difference in the state of Pennsylvania. So those are just some small issues that I think we could work on. It's in my testimony. And I wanna thank very much this committee. This is, as we heard from the previous speaker, the backbone of our city are the small businesses, the restaurants, the retail, and so on. And just like others, I'm out every day. That's why I got my mask on now. Um, and I see what the challenges are. We're gonna be walking all along uh, Upper Manhattan today because we got some yellow zones and we're gonna be giving out PPE. But what you learn when you do that is the vacancies and the challenges of getting funding to get them to be able to survive, particularly in this colder weather. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Borough well, President, thank you so much for uh, your leadership and the hard work that you're doing uh, for uh, Borough of Manhattan. Manhattan is the engine. Just the outer boroughs is the fuel that operates that engine. And I, I know you. you're just as concerned yep. about the future of our city uh, when it comes to these yes. small businesses. And um, yep. what's evident is we don't have a real plan in place for a second COVID closure. 
Yep. We don't have, we haven't set aside dollars in the form of loan and grants. And that's what our businesses need today. But we are going to make sure that they pay their real estate taxes, their water and sewer, their sales tax, and including their commercial rent tax on time. And if they don't, they're going to be subject to additional interest and penalties. Yep. This is this is sad, Borough President. I just want to add to that. Help me understand, or is it just me that feels that we're failing? No, you're absolutely right. There is uh, very little support. There's very little coordination of the different agencies, which is another topic, because in today's world, with the outdoor, the sanitation, the scaffolding, that's DOB, and you know the list goes on and on, how in these world did these agents, did these small businesses navigate all of this? And then of course you just mentioned all the fees, taxes and so on that they have to pay. Some owners are saying to their credit, give me a percentage of your sales, but that's not the majority of owners. Anybody who says that deserves a gold star, but not everybody's doing that. And so they are gonna get what you just described. So we do have, we don't have a strategy. We don't have a strategy, even if we get federal money, so you're absolutely correct. And so, I, you know, I've been talking about small business forever as you have. So it's a big, big challenge that we have to deal with. And thank God for your committee. Madam Barrow President, I wish you and the family all the blessings of Thanksgiving. And I'm looking forward to continuing this conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you. You too, sir. Thank you. Uh, we'll now move on to testimony from Andrew Riggi, and he'll be followed by testimony from Kathleen Riley. Please begin when the sergeant gives you the cue. Thank you. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Andrew Riggi. I am the executive director of the New York City Hospitality Alliance. We are a not-for-profit trade association that represents restaurants, bars, and nightclubs throughout the five boroughs. First, I'd like to thank uh, Chair Joe and I, other members of the council, uh, Borough President Brewer, Commissioner Doris, and so many others that I know are out there fighting around the clock for our small businesses in a really impossible situation. Uh, my friend Tom Gretsch had suggest, provided some numbers on the state of the city's restaurant industry. And just to reiterate, it is a dire situation. Uh, Pre-pandemic, New York City's food and drink places employed more than 300,000 New Yorkers. Back in April, in the height of the initial shutdown, uh, we dropped down to about 90,000 jobs in our industry. Thankful to outdoor dining, 25% uh, indoor occupancy, and some other policies, we've been able to hire back a lot of people. Unfortunately, there's still about 130,000 people that still do not have jobs in our industry that did back in February or early March. And now with the threat of a second closure and just the new limitations on operating hours, we could put about 100,000 of those people that we just hired back, back out of work. What are they going to do? These are people from all backgrounds, all different income levels, um, many eligible for unemployment, others un are ineligible for unemployment. There is no federal uh, enhanced unemployment. These small business owners have been unable to pay their rent going back many months, and there's no way they're going to be able to pay 100% for pre-pandemic rents moving forward. And while we understand that the council has thankfully enacted many policies that have been helpful, the inaction of the federal government to pass the Restaurants Act, to pass Save Our Stages Act, to provide more enhanced unemployment uh, support is frightening. And we really becomes incumbent on members of the city council to continue to stand up and support these businesses. Uh, we have seven policies and I've submitted written comments that I'll give a quick overview of which are within the city's jurisdiction. And of course, we're always happy to talk about additional policy ideas uh, too. First one, I've heard people talk about doing a sales tax holiday. Well, sure, that may drive consumer purchasing a bit. I'm not sure it really moves the needle. So what I would do is actually the opposite. I would say allow local restaurants, bars, small business owners that are in need to retain the sales tax collection and have it automatically converted into a, crash, a cash grant. 
What these local restaurants need is cash flow. They need to be able to pay their employees. They need to be able to pay their vendors. They need to be able to have money coming in the business so it can go out of the business. And this will continue to help spur additional economic activity that hopefully generates additional uh, sales tax revenue. And when it comes to taxes, there are quite a few. And we understand the dire fiscal situation the state and the city are in, but we also have to understand the dire fiscal situation our local small businesses are in. They are not shut because you didn't like their burger or their service. They are shut because government has mandated they be shut and be unable to generate any revenue or significantly less revenue than they could pre-pandemic. So now we need government to step up and help support us financially. And that can be a reduction in property taxes, which so many small business owners pay, usually through a triple net lease. The commercial rent tax, which is unjust and inequitable, should be repealed at a minimum right now on storefront businesses. Uh, in the city of New York, restaurants pay an excise tax on their liquor licenses, which they don't pay out anywhere else throughout the state. So we should get rid of that. Um, there are some comments about planning, coordination, and notifying these businesses. And I know things are happening in real time and it can be really difficult, but our city agencies need to continue and do the best job possible in developing and releasing guidance with as much advance notice as possible to these business owners so they can prepare for these changes. And I think it goes to the heart, and I don't want to put words in his mouth of the chair, Joe and I, is that they're at their wit's end. There's all these changes all the time. So we need to inform them about policy changes that may happen so they can decide whether or not it's the investment in the heat lamps that makes sense or any types of investments are worth it. And they can only do that by having knowledge and power. And that comes obviously from- Time expired. Uh, just a couple quick things. Um, PPE, I know, is being distributed um, out to small businesses. I'd also suggest that COVID-19 tests can be expedited for restaurant employees in particular. Because if there is one uh, report, you often have to have all of your employees um, tested, and you may have to do that before you can reopen the business again. And I've heard stories of restaurant owners going with their employees and waiting, you know, hours upon hours to get the test. So if there's a way to even coordinate on-site tests being expedited, expedited at the business location um, or somewhere conveniently, that would be helpful. Um, Data ownership. Uh, the chair knows this well because of the hearings and support he's been providing related to third party delivery platforms and the cap has been extremely helpful, the cap on the third party delivery fees. Um, what we don't always talk about is data ownership. Often the delivery companies and the reservation companies that restaurants rely on to process these orders or reservations collect the customer data their names, their email addresses, phone numbers, address, but those third party companies retain ownership of that contact information, basically putting a wall between the restaurant and their customers. We need a law that would require any customer data collected by a third party is also owned by the restaurant. That way they are empowered, especially during a second wave to have that information market directly to their customers and generate revenue to hopefully keep them in business. Quickly, license permits should all automatically renew with no fee. People should not be worrying about getting to an agency to renew any permits or licensing. And the same for any types of uh, fines. And the city, to their credit, while I know there's a lot of frustration with the inspection process in general, uh, they have been focused on education and training. And I'm not sure how many fines are being issued by city agencies. When it comes to some of the state policies, that's a, another um, issue at hand. But we need to focus on education and training as a first and hopefully only process to get compliant, which we appear uh, has been working, and fining only only as a last resort, and particularly if it poses an immediate hazard to workers and to the public. Uh, so with that, I'll leave it there, but I just want to thank your ongoing commitment uh, to the city. I think the city also needs to focus on getting federal policies passed as well, because at the end of the day, we need the Restaurants Act, and I want to thank everyone for their time. Andrew.
thank you for your strong advocacy. Thank you for your passion to protect uh, this uh, vital uh, this industry that is so vital to New York City. Um, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, and by the way, just to respond, I do have the legislation in. Um, it's being drafted on the data, uh, something that we had discussed so long ago. Um, I know that we're trying to work out uh, and get through some of the issues. And I couldn't agree with you more on how much more needs to be done. So I look forward to continuing that working relationship with you. But did the city and the state do a good job on notifying non-essential businesses and restaurants located in red and orange zones about their mandated shutdowns? You know, I think that's tough. Some people, I think, just watch the news. I think there's so much confusion um, out there. Um, I think to an extent they have, I think part of the challenge, frankly, is some of the communication. Um, I think maybe the city has email addresses on uh, file for the businesses. Well, you know how your email box goes and sometimes you don't even see it because it goes into spam or junk. Um, I've seen, you know, the city have gone out to these neighborhoods to alert the businesses. Um, I think perhaps giving an option to collect cell phone numbers uh, so people can send text messages with the information would help get the information to businesses. Um, I can tell you initially in specific areas, some in Queens, um, I did here in Brooklyn as well, um, they didn't even know that there was going to be a shutdown. I think part of the confusion comes from, frankly, you know, is it the city's 3%, the state's 3%? Uh, was it going to be based on zip code, the shutdown or the limitations, or is it going to be based on a separate geographic map that is being drawn? Um, so again, I think it's incumbent on all layers of levels of government to coordinate and communicate efficiently through all different types of channels. So I wouldn't say it was a complete disaster. I wouldn't say that it was perfect. I say there's definitely more room for improvement. And I think part of that is going to be able to figure out how to communicate to all of these different communities with language barriers, et cetera, quickly. And I think um, that could certainly continue to be improved. Thank you, Andrew. You, you heard from uh, Tom which startled me uh, that in the, in the event of a second closure, his estimates are 50% of the 6,000 restaurants in Queens would not reopen. Is that in line with the numbers that you see from your membership? Absolutely. Uh, Tom has been everywhere. Uh, constantly, you know, he's out there speaking with business owners, he sees what's going on in his neighborhoods, and it is what we're seeing, you know, throughout the city. Uh, through the Hospitality Alliance, we've been conducting almost monthly a rent survey. Uh, the most recent one for the month of October was more than 400, maybe almost 500 different businesses throughout the five boroughs. About 88% of them were unable to pay any or pay full rent in the month of October. Only one in 10 had been able to renegotiate their leases. And because that's the largest fixed cost, I think the rent issue is gonna determine how many of these businesses permanently shutter. And it may have been stated earlier, but it's certainly worth repeating. Uh, the state controller released a report perhaps a month, month and a half ago that also found between one third and one half of the city's restaurants and bars uh, could shutter. So it's absolutely in line what we're hearing and seeing, and that's why it's so important to enact these policies and so many others. And those estimates were prior to calculating the effects of a second shutdown. Correct. Uh, I think that's gonna have a bigger impact. So thank you, Andrew. Uh, we'll continue this. Um, I'm looking forward to continuing um, the dialogue so we can be more helpful and ready uh, for thank our small business. Thank you. Happy holidays to you as well. Andrew. The same to you. Thank you. And I think Tom Gretsch had a quick comment. Please go ahead. If, if I may, um, I didn't want this session to go by because truly appreciate the dedication of all the electeds on this phone call and, and other folks and, 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 the, and the Commissioner jo uh, Doris. One thing that had me have hope early in this thing was when the mayor announced that the former police commissioner, Jimmy O'Neill, was going to be coming back from California from his job after he left the PD and be like the COVID czar. And that never materialized. I'm a voracious reader. I didn't see much about that. But it seems to me now, as we're getting into the second wave and the devastation 
will be bad, maybe maybe worse than what it is. What the city does need is a fellow like a Ray Kelly, somebody that's got experience in logistics, somebody that can complement the hard work of all the people in all the different appointed positions in our city to kind of run recovery. You know, I hate to bring in politics into it, but you know, who knows who that person could be, but our elected officials, the 51, 52 council members that we have across the city of New York and our other appointees and friends, we've got to know somebody that we could put forth in that job to run recovery on a daily basis, to cut through the red tape with our, with our different agencies who are all trying to pull together, but sometimes the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. I can tell you stories about fines in the morning by one department, okays to go and at noon and another set of fines by another department by close of business. So my pitch would be to find a post COVID czar to run the, the run the entire thing under the guidance of the mayor. Clearly he's our mayor, uh, love him or hate him. But at the end of the day, it needs to be somebody that can go in there and marshal resources and get stuff done. That's my pitch. Thank you, Tom. So you're looking for a common sense person. I'm looking for somebody that has ability to marshal resources, get stuff done, and have a chain of command that we follow and that we get things done with. Looking forward to that day. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move on to Kathleen Riley for her testimony, and she'll be followed by Vetna Munasar. Uh, Ms. Riley, please begin when the sergeant gives you the cue. Thank you. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kathleen Riley. I'm the New York City Government Affairs Coordinator for the New York State Restaurant Association. And we're a trade association representing food and beverage uh, establishments throughout the city and state. Now more than eight months into the COVID-19 crisis, we are also the representative of one of the really hardest hit industries across the city, which I know has already been uh, noted a few times throughout the testimony today. So we're here today to discuss prevention of business closures in a second wave of COVID-19. It appears that we're already experiencing that wave and unfortunately NYSERA expects the restaurant industry will see business closures as a result. That is what everyone's numbers already given out today suggest and it's what we're seeing and hearing as well. The most straightforward thing that our businesses need to prevent closure is financial support and that's significant financial support significant enough to allow them to keep their businesses alive, even as their hours are reduced, even as on-site consumption is either reduced or eliminated. We know we're talking about a large investment in the restaurant industry and likely one that can only take place at the federal level. And we, along with our partners at the National Restaurant Association, have been active in advocating for the Restaurants Act and additional PPP funds. Um, we understand that New York City Council can't necessarily single-handedly deliver those asks, but we do ask that to the extent our city leaders can be vocal on this issue and collaborate with state and federal leadership to advocate for kind of relief, that would be a great help to the restaurant industry. And it's something that we hope you will consider uh, really embracing. Other areas that we'd like to just briefly touch on today, um, to the extent the city is able to help broker rent relief or provide incentives for lease renegotiations, I know that's been very difficult for many of our members, even in cases where common sense suggests their landlords wouldn't really be able to bring in another active tenant. They're still having a really hard time negotiating when it's just person to person. So if there were a way that the city could help provide some incentives for lease renegotiations or rent relief, either one of those would be a really major impact. Uh, a focus, as has been mentioned already, on education-based enforcement for departments around the city and I know that some are already doing that. I know the Department of Health is already doing that, but just to keep that approach around for the foreseeable future, as long as it is that these businesses are really suffering, um, that has been a very helpful approach and we hope that it will continue. Delaying or eliminating taxes and fees wherever possible. I know a whole laundry list of taxes have already been mentioned today. One in particular that we had heard concern about from a member was about uh, rent tax and how businesses subject to rent tax are being asked to pay based on their full rent, even if they haven't paid rent to their landlord, unless it's been formally forgiven or reduced by the landlord. And just given the ongoing nature of this crisis, there's plenty of businesses who are still 
in the middle of negotiating or going back and forth with their landlords who don't have a formal forgiveness, but also realistically aren't going to be paying full rent. They just simply cannot afford it. So asking for a tax on a transaction that has not occurred and the tenants can't afford to pay it uh, is, is really is really strenuous for them. Uh, another thing that I, it's possible that I've missed, but I haven't seen anything about it, the adjacent property usage for open restaurants. It was announced as part of the plan to extend the open restaurants program. Uh, last I checked on the DOT website, it said that something would be forthcoming to formalize how you could go about using adjacent properties um, and getting the SLA on board with that. It doesn't seem like it's uh, come together just yet. So if we could expedite that, that would be great. I know that as the weather gets colder, it is more and more difficult to get really good usage out of the outdoor spaces. So it time is of the essence really in terms of getting whatever nice days we can left in the season. Um, last but not least that I'd like to mention, it would be sort of indirectly helpful, I would say. From what we're hearing, the vast majority of our contract tracing is coming up with an indeterminate cause of where somebody has picked up COVID. I think it said somewhere around 80%, they weren't sure where it came from. And given that certain industries or certain operations or certain hours are being targeted as the likely cause or a potential risky place that people might be getting COVID, it, what we really just need is data backed up policy, policy that is founded in our data, that's specific to New York City, that's specific to the way that the requirements that we have to run our restaurants under, that we have to run our bars under, we just need to know, are the cases actually coming from there or not? And if they're not, thank you. Um, basically at the end of the day, if the limitations that we're, we are putting in place are not founded in, in data, then they might not wind up being helpful to the public health, but they will absolutely damage the businesses that they're targeting. So to the extent the city is able to, uh, sort of better pinpoint where these cases are coming from, that would also be very helpful. Again, thank you so much to the committee for holding this hearing. At the end of the day, doing everything we can to save restaurants matters, not just because they represent livelihoods, family legacies, major personal investments by the operators, but because they're such important job providers for this city, which I know all of you are well aware of. So thank you for considering this topic today and thank you for taking the time to hear our testimony. Thank you, Kathleen. I'm going to ask you the same question. Um, what a second wave a shutdown. Uh, mm -hmm. What are your estimates uh, based on uh, the surveys that you received um, that restaurants and bars will go out of business statewide? I would say that they're in line with what else has been shared today. Honestly, people's predictions earlier on have been just as dire, if not more dire. Some of them may have been able to hold on through this more optimistic fall that we had and end of the summer and fall that we had. But with a second shutdown, I think people are just really at their wits end because they feel like they've sort of left it all out on the field up until now. And so if they have to then close their doors again or be stuck back with doing takeout and delivery again, they're they're just not sure how it is that you can possibly make it through the winter in that in that scenario. Yeah, Kathleen, if I don't know the number statewide, it doesn't come to my uh, mind restaurants what's the number statewide the full number of restaurants statewide yes i think it's around fifty thousand. because i remember new york city having about half of the state's restaurants but i can check for a specific number with you i, I don't have it right in front of me i'm just trying to put things in perspective that would be sure. devastating Fifty thousand businesses yeah. if you lose half of them uh, that's going to have a real impact on uh, the future of this city and uh, it'll create economic devastation for the tax base of the city and the state. So that was the yes. point that I was trying to make. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you for your hard work and wishing your family uh, all the blessings of this holiday season. You too, council member. Thank you. Uh, we'll next hear from Vetna Munasar, followed by Karen Narevsky. Uh, uh, Ms. Munasar, please begin when, when the sergeant gives you the cue. Thank you. Time starts now. I'm the executive director of the Yemen American Merchants Association called YAMA. It's a nonprofit collective work for the betterment of local Yemeni American merchants through education, business, and social services. On behalf of our membership, we would like to thank the chairman and chair members 
for us submitting our testimony today. YAMA is an organization that is dedicated in, to elevate, educate, and advocate for Yemeni American merchants to support bodega owners and workers. We represent 3,000 of the 12,000 bodegas in New York City and 15,000 bodega workers across five boroughs. Our members of bodega owners, like all small businesses, have been hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. As designated essential businesses, operations have slowed with a drop in customers, leading to fewer worker hours and needing to reduce worker shifts of the frequent and stay afloat. Unfortunately, the economic aid coming into our bodegas is not the same as a typical small business. We request that our partners in the city government provide guidance for our membership base to access aid during the second wave of this pandemic. Many immigrants own small businesses, cannot afford to pay a traditional accountant and closely payroll services for their small numbers of employees. This manages their business in traditional ways, accounting for businesses, operations, through pen and notebook by their booking. The current loan being offered by the U.S. Small Business Administration, SBA, such as coronavirus aid relief, economic security cares, and the Paycheck Protection Program and Healthcare Enhancement Act requires a high level of payroll accounting, does not align with the business operations for the bodegas in New York City. Recently, Yama conducted a survey amongst its members in order to have a holistic view of financial assistance needed and how we as an organization can propel our small businesses as we recover from COVID-19. We surveyed 50 members who reached out for assistance to apply for the SBA loan. Out of the 50, only 10 were qualified for the SBA loan. We found the remaining of 40 businesses did not have professional pay payroll system, thus could not provide the required documents. This has been a really difficult experience, navigating the pandemic, unemployment insurance application because the language and the technology barrier. The majority of bodega owners workers are Yemeni descent and therefore there's a language barrier speaking Arabic, especially with the Yemeni dialect. Our members run bodegas are cornerstones of their community. Our member businesses have continued to operate during the pandemic to ensure the members of our community have an access to basic necessities as toiletries, masks, and cleaning products, food and water, and et cetera. Bodegas provide a sense of convenience to its customers who wish to stay close to home while they're also evading, avoiding business, busy, busy supermarkets. In this time of our national health crisis, loans should be available to all of our small business bodega owners who are in good financial standing. Local immigrant businesses should not be disadvantaged for sole reason they do not meet the administrative requirements that is unrelated to the standing as good business operators. Yama is proud to continue our advocacy efforts on behalf of our small businesses during this time. Now more than ever, we need our partners in the government to work alongside of our members to assure small businesses owned by minority owners are given the necessary tools to keep their businesses open. We recommend the following of the Small Business Committee, an act providing rent relief for 90 days as did the state for residents. Secondly, providing financial assistance with minimal requirements. Last spring immigrant run small businesses were shut out of the relief because of the, the list of requirements. And lastly, providing small business grants to purchase refrigerators that is energy efficient to lower electrical bills using soda sugar tax as they did in California. And again, I would like to thank you, the city council for allowing us to provide testimony on behalf of our 3000 Yemeni bodega owners in New York City. We look forward to working alongside you in the near future. Thank you. I wanna thank you so much for uh, testifying today. I am very familiar with the work of your uh, association, Yama, and the Yemeni community, which uh, I, I enjoy, and I have the privilege and honor of representing. Um, I have a large Yemeni community uh, that lives in my, that calls home in my district. And I'm very proud of their hard work. Uh, you summed it up so well. Uh, the bodega industry in particular has not received the attention. You can't market your products online. You don't benefit from third-party food delivery apps. Your business model is on side streets where it's convenient for someone to stop by for the miscellaneous items, uh, things that they have forgotten to pick up while they were out, or things that they needed in case of an emergency. You're open 24 hours a day, you're, and I couldn't agree with you more on how 
overlook your industry is. And this is the entire gamma of bodegas. I put in just so you know, and I, I know that you are aware of this, Junior's Law, where we're supposed to provide the security to all of our bodegas that in the event of a tragedy that could have helped prevent that tragedy and future tragedies, where there's a security button that it immediately notifies law enforcement of an incident, as well as an outdoor siren and light that advises the community that something is going on indoors. Secondly, I put in for PPE and testing. If required, bodegas need that assistance. We need PPE, and that, also, that doesn't just include masks. That means the enclosures that are needed to be put in place to prevent um, or to comply with the social distancing spread of COVID. So I'm grateful to you and thank you for being a part of it. I will continue to be a strong advocate for your industry. Uh, and uh, I'm grateful to the Yemeni community for their hard work and contribution to this city. You are, it has not gone unnoticed. Thank you, Chairman. I appreciate your work. Thank you very much. We'll now hear from Karen Narevsky, who is our last registered panelist. And you may begin when the sergeant gives you the cue. Thank you. Time starts now. Thank you so much, um, Chair Jonai and members of the Small Business Committee. Um, happy to testify today. My name is Karen Narevsky. Uh, I'm the Senior Organizer for Equitable Economic Development at ANHD, the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development. Um, and we're working to build community power with our more than 80 neighborhood-based member organizations across New York City. Um, as part of that work, um, we also convene the United for Small Business New York City Coalition, um, which is a coalition of community organizations across the city fighting to protect small businesses from the threat of displacement. Um, and as you all know, businesses in these communities were really vulnerable even before the pandemic. Um, and it's been obviously very frustrating um, to many of our members and the businesses that we work with to see uh, the lack of resources that are in place and the lack of um, really comprehensive policies um, to deal with the impact of the pandemic. Um, and our experience from uh, the businesses that we work with throughout the city is that rents are the biggest threat to small businesses and the biggest impediment to their eventual recovery. So we know that some businesses have been able to negotiate short-term compromises with their landlords, um, but some have just negotiated waiting periods and will be expected to pay months of back rent. Uh, we know that many property owners are limited because they also have mortgages to pay. So we understand um, that this is a major challenge and we think that um, rent relief is really a critical issue. I was glad to hear um, Kathleen mention it in her testimony as well. Um, and so we know obviously that um, there are budget constraints at the city level. Uh, we know that there's been an action at the federal level, but we would also ask this committee and the administration to look at what's happening at the state level. Um, there's a, a very promising bill, State Senate Bill 8865, Assembly Bill 10901, uh, which is sponsored by um, Senator Brad Hoylman and Assemblymember Harvey Epstein, which would provide a partial rent abatement to impacted commercial tenants, along with reimbursement for impacted landlords. Um, so this is similar to the model that the MTA just implemented for its commercial tenants in Grand Central um, and other areas. And we think this is um, you know, rather than expecting small businesses to bear the entire financial burden of the pandemic, we think that this is a more equitable approach that allows um, small businesses, property owners, and the government to share in the in the financial burden. Um, so we'd encourage the council to work with state legislators to help pass this, perhaps passing a resolution in support of the bill, um, and working towards real rent relief. Um, in the longer term, there is already legislation pending in the council that could help our independent small business sector. Um, I know that we're really focused during this hearing on the second wave that we're in right now. And I think it's helpful rather than saying, if we hit a second wave, we should just acknowledge that we are in a second wave and we should be, we hope that it, uh, you know, we can hope that we don't enter a red zone or an orange zone, but we should act as though we're, we're there and provide the resources that, um, that small businesses will need. Um, so the two pieces of legislation that I wanted to mention are Intro 1796. 
This is actually a long-term piece of legislation that would provide commercial rent regulation. And while it may seem strange to talk about long-term legislation uh, when we're in the middle of an urgent crisis, we know that there are predatory actors um, and unscrupulous uh, speculators who are waiting for small businesses to shut down, scoop up that real estate, and then consolidate it um, for profit. We saw this during the 2008 financial crisis. We know that this is happening um, now. Um, and we want to make sure that um, rents don't continue to escalate for the businesses that um, are able to make it through this crisis due to support from from the government and other sources. So we would ask um, that the chair schedule a hearing for this bill for intro 1796 and, and move it forward before the session is over. Um, and also to support um, an important bill that is not in this committee, but intro 1116, uh, which is an important step for some of the city's smallest businesses, um, street vendors. Um, that's in the uh, committee on uh, consumer affairs. Um, but we'd ask members of this committee to support it and help it um, pass as soon as possible. Um, those, as I said, those are our city's smallest businesses and many of them have received no support. Um, and finally, um, we're very pleased that the administration and SBS were able to reinstate the commercial lease assistance program. Um, and we hope that they're moving swiftly to in, uh, enact new grant and loan programs um, as has been mentioned, we're hoping to avoid some of the problems that came up with the um, grant and loan programs in the spring. Um, and we really want to emphasize um, the need for language accessibility in the applications for those programs. To speak to the point that um, that Namunasar just mentioned, that the app, uh, applications should be accessible to businesses who calculate their payroll and, and expenses in a variety of different ways, and that they should be distributed equitably to ensure that all areas of the city are benefiting. Um, thank you again, and happy to answer any questions. Karen, I want to thank you for your testimony and uh, for your patience. Uh, your input is valuable, and, we wanna, I want, and I agree with you. We need to be proactive and not reactive. We shouldn't wait for devastation to figure out uh, how to help. Uh, we should be uh, addressing the scenario before, and I agree that we should be looking at this if we are in the second phase and what that means. My question, how many members do you have, Karen, that you represent, how many small businesses? Um, so we, uh, our membership for our United for Small Business New York City Coalition is actually made up uh, of organizations that work with different businesses. So we have about 15 member organizations and each of those groups works with um, additional businesses throughout the city. So some of our members are community-based groups um, like uh, WEDCO in the Bronx or um, Chaya CDC in Queens that work with, um, with hundreds of businesses throughout their catchment areas. Some of them are legal services providers who may have supported small businesses um, I believe that in the last few years, they've supported um, a thousand businesses through the commercial lease assistance program. Um, so we really are getting a sampling of a lot of different um, business experiences throughout the city. Thank you, Karen. The reason I ask you is if we do have a second wave shutdown, do you have any estimates on the number of businesses through the feedback that you're getting that will not survive and close? We heard from uh, several of those that testified that the number roughly is 50% in the hospitality, the restaurant business. Mm -hmm. I was hoping to hear from you if you knew uh, or have any gauge or estimation. Um, so it's actually, it's, it's kind of challenging to make those estimations. I would say I don't disagree with some of the estimates that I've heard from other um, panelists today. Um, you know, the businesses that we work with are seeing losses in revenue from 50% all the way up to 100%. And so I think um, depending on um, what the second wave looks like and what resources are available. Um, I think, you know, 50% is a, is a reasonable estimate. It's, it's hard to know without additional information about um, exactly where businesses are right now. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you for testifying today, wishing you and for your family healthy, peaceful, and safe holiday. Stay in touch with us as we move forward and try to address these challenges. It's going to require city, state, and federal. And I don't think we have that um, between all three branches of government. We do agree with you that 
And I think you agree with my statement that the city should have its own program in place now, informing our small businesses what they should expect in the form of aid and assistance ahead of a closure. Let's not wait for the closure to happen and then for those to scramble and find out what resources are available. So thank you, Kevin. Thank you, and look forward to seeing the action from um, this committee as well on, on some of the matters that the panelists have brought up today. Thank you. Hey, and so committee, uh, I think Thank that you. was the last testifier. Yes, Chair, thank you. Um, just in case if we had inadvertently missed anyone who has registered to testify today and has not yet been called, please use the Zoom hand raise function and I will call on you if you do so. Seeing none at this point, I invite you, Chair Jonai, to adjourn the hearing and then call for any closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, and I want to thank all those that participated and listened in in today's hearing. I'm looking forward to working with all of our stakeholders to address the challenges that we have. Certainly, these are going to be what is in my lifetime probably the most difficult challenges that I've ever seen, especially when it comes to uh, small businesses. So I'm grateful to all of you for your input, your participation, and we're going to be pressing this administration as well as the other branches of government to do their part to be there for our small businesses. When they go, there goes our city, there goes our state, and we need our businesses to stay open and we need to do more. So this will conclude our small business hearing. Thank you. <laughs>